with your colleagues who, who need this, uh, this option that it is available on our training sessions. Um, I wanna have my, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Karan Phillips introduce herself. She will be advancing slides and helping to field questions today. So Karan, do you wanna do a quick intro? Sure, good afternoon. My name is uh, Karan Phillips. I am a policy development manager with TIFA and I am excited to you all here today to join us for our September training. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so um, if you all will please keep your devices on mute during the presentations, we will have time for questions and answers and discussion following today's presentation. You can either share them in the chat or hold them till the end and, and we can have a, a really good robust discussion today. Next slide, please. So I'm really happy today to introduce Carrie Mulkey, who is the Director of the Bureau of Aging and Disability Resources in the Wisconsin Department of Health. Um, Carrie and I and Jane Carmody from the Johnny Hartford Foundation have presented together many times and the energy that, um, that Carrie brings is infectious. And we were talking earlier before, uh, before we admitted you all to the session that doing this work together and the, the healthy aging work is catching on and, and the collaboration is catching on, but it's still not everywhere. And so um, we're, we're really excited to hear Carrie's story of, um, of how the collaboration kind of happened and is happening and the extent of the work now that she is leading there. So Carrie, thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate it and look forward to uh, your presentation. Thank you so much, Megan. And Thank you to everybody for taking time today to um, hear my presentation. And I do have a PowerPoint. There we go, beautiful. <laughs> so um, you mentioned that uh, I get to share my story and it, it really is a story that I love to tell. Sometimes stories happen with intention. Uh, we create those stories and sometimes they happen on accident and they become one of our favorite stories that we get to tell. And in so many ways, it's the latter that happens. So I'm really thrilled to be able to share my story with you today. So again, just um, my name is Carrie Mulkey and I do work for Wisconsin. So this is Wisconsin story. But I do hope that what I share with you today does give you some, some thoughts and ideas of things that you can do within your own organization to really advance age-friendly states. Um, and just, I'll share some different components with you about what, how I envision that and um, how we've come to uh, implement this within our own state. So also acknowledging that this first slide does say June 4th. That was the last time that Megan and I <laughs> gave our presentation together, but I do recognize that fall is upon us. So um, please forgive that error. And uh, I welcome you uh, to, to the session as well. So go ahead with the next slide, please. So there's a, a bunch of boxes on here and they're intentionally in boxes because this is how so much of this work happens today. We have these huge systems that have such potential to grow in terms of becoming more age friendly. But in many ways, these boxes, I put these here and I'll go through each of them um, uh, specifically in a moment, but just to make the point that part of what we need to do in order to build an age-friendly state or an age-friendly whatever it is, you know, from the space that you come is to really look at how we integrate all these boxes together. They are all equally important and they all contribute to creating an age-friendly state and in our, our state in age-friendly Wisconsin. So the first one to highlight is the um, equitable and inclusive communities and systems. That one is first intentionally. This is, there is so much work um, that we need to do in this space, understanding how ageism, ableism, and racism creates barriers to health and how they're embedded in all of our systems and how we need to really be centering and focusing on that within all of the system, other systems that you also see on this slide. So in addition to equitable and inclusive communities and systems, age-friendly communities is a whole other category um, of effort and work. And again, grounding this work in communities as the place where um, changes really do happen and where people experience um, where they live. So um, age-friendly communities is something I'll talk a little bit about more um, in a future slide. 
Another system is the age-friendly public health system, which again is where many of you come from. Um, so there are strategies and ways that we can look to build an age-friendly public health system. And then health systems as another box here, another system that's critically important in advancing age friendliness. Um, so age friendly health systems is another box category here. And then the last one that I have here just to highlight is something that I've, I just coined. It's not really a thing, but it's something that I came up with to describe where I see the need for aging systems to be moving as well to become more public health friendly. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means to me, actually, I believe on the very next slide. So you can go ahead and advance. So our story actually starts uh, from a place, as I mentioned, um, that wasn't, that was almost an accident. So our, we are a part of, our, our division of public health and the bureau that I'm a part of is a part of a, organization, a, a, a department of health services. And it includes all of our Medicaid programs. And we were a department that had some Medicaid programs organizationally situated in, you know, one silo over here. And then our long-term care, our long-term care Medicaid programs were siloed in another part of our organization over here. And there was an interest in really bringing together all of our Medicaid programs. Well, we had been organizationally situated with our Medicaid programs that were long-term care so that all long-term care programs were integrated. And so when, they, when our organization wanted to move to integrate our um, Medicaid programming, it kind of left us with, what do we do with you? <laughs> what do we do with this big Bureau of Aging and Disability Resources who serves the entire population of older adults and people with disabilities? So in some ways, um, you know, like I said, it was an accident that, you know, as they looked across the rest of the department that um, they thought, hmm, you know, public health, they serve, you know, full population of folks. How, you know, how about we put them there? And so in some ways, it was a bit of a stretch. That's the reflection in the slide. It was a little bit of a stretch of like putting us into the division of, of public health. So, there really wasn't, frankly, a clear picture or a vision for where we fit and why we fit there. And to be honest, there was little engagement, frankly, with our Bureau of Aging and Disability Resources with public health previously, despite the fact that they were a part of our same umbrella organization. And I suspect that some of you might also be organizationally situated that way as well. And I also acknowledge and just um, almost with embarrassment that I had a completely wrong perception of what public health even was. You know, I really thought of it as the, it was the entities that told me to wash my hands in the bathroom. It is, <laughs> it clearly is, but I didn't realize how much bigger and broader public health was. And I also had the perception that the public health system didn't really care for older adults and people with disabilities, that it was more centered around helping people achieve old age and achieve longevity, but kind of stop there. And I, and, and, and I say that, and I, I mentioned that I say that with embarrassment, but I've also found as we've grown our partnerships along the way, that other folks, they validate that. Um, other public health folks have validated. It's true, we actually didn't pay much attention to older adults. So, um, so just acknowledging that we had a clear disconnect between our systems. We didn't necessarily know about them. We didn't know they existed. We didn't know how we could truly benefit from each other. So integrating aging into public health was what happened organizationally. And then if you could go ahead and click for me. But the benefit here too was also about integrating public health into aging. And then you can go ahead and click. So I talked about how we joined public health and then we learned to really understand what public health was 
And it really didn't take us long to realize, not only did we know very little about public health and vice versa, that there was a lot to learn, but it also didn't take us long to realize that we were exactly where we needed to be. Whether it was we were talking about our mission, vision, values, um, our, uh, our, how we served the population, what our aspirations were, all of how important data is to this work, how important narrative is to this work, how important um, just really all of the different components of the public health system and the aging system, how important it was to really see the potential and the alignment for collaboration across all of our systems. So understanding what contributes to health as well, we found that we were doing a whole lot around social determinants of health without really even using that word or knowing what it was. So you'll find through my presentation, I'm, 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 I'm being pretty open about what I didn't know. And um, so forgive me, but I say that to you because it's probably true within other aging systems throughout the state. And, but the good thing is that we may not have known the word social determinants of health, but we have experience with how to impact those areas. So focusing on transportation, focusing on income, employment, and all of the other things that contribute to our health. Our system has always been grounded in those spaces. So being able to offer that into the public health space has been so important as well. So, so understanding what all contributes to our health um, again, was part of the foundation building that happened in our state between our different systems. Building new partnerships and our collective capacity to act has been also so instrumental and foundational, and I have quite a bit to say about that next. And so this is kind of our continuum of starting with an accident joining public health in a way, learning along the way. And now we're really in a space where we describe ourselves as public health. We are public health our aging system in Wisconsin is public health. So we really have come a long way and we've seen extreme benefits from that integration. So go ahead then onto the next slide, please. So I wanted to share with you this framework that uh, I lead from, that I lead with within my bureau that we're invested in, that we model to our network and to our peers. And it's a model that I put together because I was um, trying to create both from a, 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 for people who want to visualize a framework um, and also to integrate words, narrative that matters, but taking the good thinking from my experience in the aging system and my experience in the public health system and putting them collectively together. So I wanna just walk through this really quickly, but it's all rooted in transformation. And I feel like so much of what has transpired for us in the last five years, so we joined public health five years ago, I neglected to say that, but the journey we've been on for the last five years has been very transformational. And today, when you look back just even at the last 18 months, it, we have really been in a moment of disruption where transformation is happening and having kind of a paradigm or a way to make sense of how to, how to embrace that transformation and come out um, in a better place on the other side. This is the model that I use to speak to that. So I wanted to share it with you. So um, I'm gonna have you click a bunch of different times here uh, to, to create this picture. So go ahead with the first click, please. So first, um, I, I hope you can see this, but the words that you see on this swoosh here um, is the word long path. So the story here is that many times, as you know, we spend our time thinking about uh, what the next three months will bring, what the next six months will bring. And we absolutely have had to do that uh, most recently with COVID and other things that um, happen in our public health space. And sometimes there, when we operate that way, we're not always thinking about the, the future, right? And so this is a long path actually is rooted not just in the next three months, six months, or even 10 years. We're talking about what do we need to do today to transform our systems 
to support the next generation of older adults and people with disabilities. So it's, it's foundational to our decision making. And so it thinks it incorporates things like futures thinking and transgenerational thinking. So again, as we make decisions, not just thinking about what the consequences are for the next three months, but also for the next generation. So this is kind of the backdrop of a lot of this. And, and I have found that not many people think this way or even have the space to think this way with all of the things that are happening. So we have to continually remind ourselves to be long path thinkers in, our, in this transformation that we're in. So go ahead with the next click. There's the transformation called out and then go ahead with the next one. So part of the transformation and the journey that we've been on and the goal that we have is to create healthy organizations. So we have been spending a lot of time both internally within our Bureau of Aging and Disability Resources, within our Division of Public Health, and with the entire network that we serve, that it is essential that we move ourselves into ensuring a place of health. Um, and this is both on an individual self um, point of view, but also a cultural point of view within our organizations. And so we've been um, focusing on something called the, the integral model. And um, that first, the first circle that you see on there with the four quadrants is actually representative of this integral model. And as I mentioned, it incorporates the self and building our own health, making sure that we are strong in order to move the systems and make the transformations that we know that we need to make, we have to be in a place of strength. The bottom quadrant um, reflects actually company culture or our agency internal culture. And that too is about making sure our culture is strong and healthy in order to move systems. And then it also integrates um, being very clear about tasks and other systems and setting up our tasks and our processes to be forward thinking and moving things forward. So um, the other circle that you see here is also a ripple. So we take very seriously that it's not just about creating our own healthy self and our own healthy organization, but rippling it out to more and more people who really can benefit from new tools that are needed really in the space of complexity that we're finding ourselves in these days. So healthy organizations, and then go ahead onto the next click, please. So healthy communities. So um, I spoke a little bit about this, but really just centering communities as being essential to um, where this work happens. And coming from a government state entity, I will tell you that this, while I hear myself say it, it seems like a real obvious thing now, but this has been very transformational. It's required a lot of change on our part to not see ourselves as the one who solves the problem. Um, from the state level, we have a really important role to set vision and provide help and support to communities to give them tools to create their own healthy futures, but to recognize that we are in a support role and that the work, the hard work and the change that's really needed needs to come from communities. So it is refocusing and recentering the role that state agencies play. So that is what that one is. But again, a pillar here or a wing on our transformational butterfly, <laughs> as you see it, is to really focus on creating healthy communities to do this work. Next. Thank you. So the third pillar or wing is really looking at healthy patterns. So here it is pulling out all of the data. <laughs> the data that we know that we need and not just looking at the data that often shows similar things, but asking, approaching it as a pattern, pattern that we see and asking why those patterns are in place and then working to change those patterns to become healthy patterns. So a lot of our equity work is centered in this way. And this is about pulling together our resources, our people, our funding, to really impact those um, patterns to create healthy, healthy patterns um, and to make sure we have robust data that can help us um, uh, not only see the position that we're in now, but to make sure that we're moving in the right direction and really changing the trajectory for many of our communities. 
Next. All right, and the last pillar here is healthy systems. And this too, I've come to realize that, um, especially as we've been living in a, a place of scarcity for a very long time, scarcity by way of funding, is that we often aren't thinking about or training our folks on how to do systems change and acknowledging how important the systems are to all of the work that we do. So building healthy systems is also a part of the framework um, here that is essentially important. So we've been investing in training folks on how to do systems thinking, how to actually dream a little bit uh, and think about what we really need to create age-friendly systems and communities and to um, recognize what role we can play in creating healthy systems. And then there's just a couple more clicks here on this slide. Thanks for bearing with me with all these clicks. Um, you can do a couple more actually. And then one more. Great. So last then is a, to kind of wrap up this framework is that as we focus on all these different pillars, these different components and the long path in the back, it really is all about helping to create healthy futures. So next slide. So in terms of building our collective capacity to act, recognizing that both the aging system as well as the public health system, we do these things. It's about working upstream, all of our prevention, working to reduce negative health outcomes and really working to improve quality of life. We share these things. This is our focus in public health and in the aging space. And the other thing that you see on this slide is also a different way of looking at things. And for me, this is about power. So often we operate in each of our spaces like an ego system where it's about us, it's competitive. We don't necessarily, sometimes we talk about collaboration, but still from a place of I'm over here and they're over there and we talk and maybe we collaborate. But what I'm trying to move us to and what we've been um, moving towards and talking about in our state is moving to an ecosystem sort of way of thinking rather than that ecosystem way of thinking. So that it really is about us all moving collectively together and recognizing that sometimes the best ideas come from, from the fringe and it's all connected. And so anyway, it's just, a, it's about co-creating. And I just find this, um, it, it creates for me to a visualization of how connected uh, when, when you, if you just even think about how our environment works, you know, everything is so interconnected. And if we would look at each other in that way, we can make huge progress. So it really is a conceptual, another conceptual framework um, that we've been um, training around and really elevating within our state. So go ahead and click one more time here on this slide. So I got this quote actually from my boss, who is the deputy administrator for the Wisconsin Division of Public Health. And, and I asked him, I said, you know, what do you think, you know, since our bureau has joined the Division of Public Health, what have been some of the benefits? And he, the, the good thing is that he actually gave me a lot of them <laughs> instead of, I'm glad I didn't hear crickets when, he, when I asked him that, he actually had a list. But I wanted to pull this one out um, to make the point that I was trying to make here too, is that having Bader as the Bureau of Aging and Disability Resources in the Division of Public Health has made us more aware of all of the systems, how they intersect, and how we make full use of all the resources we have. So thank you, Chuck, for that, that quote. Um, and he there, you know, just to reiterate that he has clearly seen the benefits as well of us joining public health. So go ahead then onto the next slide. Thank you. So this too um, is again another foundational piece to how we think um, in our state that I that I also think is helping to propel us. Um, in moving our systems, both in the aging space and the public health space, um, to be more effective and, and um, really working together more integrated in an integrated way. 
So I love this model. Um, and so, and I tweaked it a little bit um, from, from the source that I got it from. But again, centering different types of partnerships and way that we, ways that we interact with each other. So um, I don't know if, if you folks have seen this before, but you know, starting with a type of partnership where we're informing each other. So you know, I'll provide information to you and please tell me what you've got going on. That sort of relationship happens. And it's more of a partnership where you're keeping each other informed. And we discovered that early on when we started to do our work, that's how we were operating. And I discovered that so that's how some of the local work is happening too. People, so, and, and part of my point is let's not stay stuck there. <laughs> so, but let's, you know, keep moving down this continuum. So you can see here on the slide, you know, moving into more of a consultation um, role. Sometimes that is a beneficial role, obtaining feedback from each other about decisions that, you know, one agency needs to make and, and starting to, you know, acknowledge um, either concerns or points of view, and then involving. Um, you know, this is where we're making sure that concerns and aspirations of both entities are really coming together in decisions that are being made. Collaboration is involving partners in each aspect of our decision making. So this is about looking for actual advice um, and actually integrating it into decisions as much as possible. Integration is yet one step further where we're really making decisions together. And this is really how far we've come within our um, division, by it, but it's taken work, it's taken years to get there. Um, but again, just recognizing where we are, are and have been on this partnership continuation has helped us get to this space where we're really integrated. And then I added this last um, piece here, which is that sometimes we need to actually shift decision-making and power. Um, and so in some cases, um, recognizing that it's actually not our decision to make, it needs to be made you know, by um, a community or another entity. And so it's more of a supportive role. So I wanted to share that with you as well. Next slide. And now I'm gonna go into some examples of how this integration has really come um, to help us really move some critically important things in our state. So first, a real focus on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And part of the story I wanna tell here really quickly is that um, having the chance to focus on people with disabilities as well, um, often that group is overlooked and so being able to elevate that in all of our, uh, our justice equity, diversity and inclusion or health equity work has been really, really important. And um, just even things like within, within our state health assessment that we recently completed and we're moving to our state health improvement plan, um, really elevating the voices of people with disabilities and older adults in our plan and all of the intersectionalities as well. Our plan this time is so different than it was a couple of years ago because of this integration. And it really has allowed us to focus on all of the disparities that exist across our communities and to lift them all up and find ways, um, unique solutions for each of those groups. Next slide. So um, I think we went past one on COVID. There we go. Um, so just talking about the partnership that has happened over the last 18 months um, that we're all still in, of course. So, but just being critical members of both the state and local emergency operations, integrating our aging system into this, um, being able to bring the expertise and populations that um, were most impacted, at least with the first round of um, COVID, has been really impactful uh, to our response. So being able to bring that expertise into this space, providing leadership and resiliency, recovery, long-term thinking and advocacy. So our network is really founded in advocacy and they are their, um, our network is um, the infrastructure of our network is in every community. So every county, every tribe, 
um, and in some cases beyond counties. You know, there's several um, agencies, for example, within a county. Um, but having access to an infrastructure like that, a network like that, that has advocacy skills for both people who are older, but for the public health system as a whole has been really helpful in advancing um, what we know we need in this state and in terms of response. Connections to community partners. So kind of hearkening back to uh, my supervisor Chuck's comment, you know, um, that community partnership, being able to make links um, within communities in new and different ways has been incredibly beneficial to our state as we've been working on response and recovery. Having a broad perspective of the long-term care system. So early on when people were talking about the long-term care system, there was, um, well, I just wanna say it this way, only a focus on facilities. And um, uh, uh, you know, knowing obviously how important it is to focus on facilities and the congregate nature of facilities um, is, is essential. So that my comments are not um, intended to um, uh, be judgmental in that space, but, or I should say, and what we offer is, is really that broader point of view about how the long-term care system really works because most people actually live in the community. In our state, it's 95% of older adults live in community spaces, not in institutional settings. So being able to kind of bring that broad perspective into the system um, and doing things like you know, elevating the fact that there are people who are, are um, homebound, right? And, and don't have access to services and um, vaccines and, and those sorts of things. We've been working um, with TIFA in that space as well. But early on, we were on top of this because of that integration and being able to bring our broad perspective to the table. So in other words, we've been at the table through the response and we will be through the recovery. Um, and it has allowed us to really advance um, some of this work that we know is so important. And then the last thing on this slide is looking at communication access and technology expertise. So um, thinking about how important technology has been this last year and a half, it always has been, but it really has been elevated. Um, this has been just really important as well, whether it's helping people, um, helping to reach people who are homebound, right? Um, or it is um, for, for helping to look at the social isolation um, issues that have resulted, well, have been around for a long time too, but have again been elevated as a result of, of what we're facing these days. So, you know, we have people on staff who are really knowledgeable about this. Um, it was really helpful as we were creating our vaccine uh, registration and other types of systems to be able to provide consultation on how to make sure that it's accessible for all populations we were at the table for that right from the beginning. So it was really beneficial for that reason too. There's a whole lot I could say about that too, but how about we jump to the next slide? <laughs> I have a couple more examples and I really look forward to your questions as well. So similarly, um, we've been working within the, our division of public health um, to bring expertise into the emergency preparedness response and recovery system. And you can go ahead and click. I have a couple of examples here. So first we worked with, um, we have a council for uh, a council on physical disabilities. And so our council led the way in this regard, but this was a joint effort with, within public health, both with our bureau and other, other parts of our public health system to create this emergency preparedness toolkit. And we were incredibly thankful that we built this actually before COVID so that it was ready to go um, to help people have access to um, just all the things that they need to think about when they're in any type of emergency. But it did include things related to this, you know, uh, um, responding to infectious diseases as well. So that was, was really helpful. And you can go ahead and click. This was the cover sheet uh, um, to this. Another thing as well is um, in looking at um, people with hearing loss, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, we also um, provided training to our interpreters to ensure that they had the words um, and the signs that were um, 
uh, needing actually to be built out and so that we could ensure that people had access to information and that our interpreters were well trained. So this was another thing that we worked on together. And then the next slide, please, or the next click here. This was a communications tool that we created as well. Um, and this is for people who, um, uh, who are either nonverbal or um, might be hard of hearing or, well, it meets the needs of several different types of disabilities. And so this can be used um, in all sorts of interactions. In fact, um, this, this has been incredibly helpful at our testing sites, um, at our vaccine clinics, that, that we have these available there. We also put them in the hands of individuals so that they can bring it with them um, as a communication tool. So um, we do have this, yeah, we do have this available for others to, to use as well. So um, again, just in helping ensure that all people can access um, what we need. Next slide. So be at the beginning of this year, um, a group of us came together um, across our aging space and our public health space to really look at how we could impact the issue of social isolation and loneliness, um, com basically community cohesion and sense of belonging was all part of that as well. And so what we did is we created a coalition to end social isolation and loneliness. And the coalition focuses on, um, uh, we developed four aims for the coalition and you can, um, that is, a little hard to see on here, but uh, I'll try and say them so that you can at least have access to them. Speaking of ha having access to information. So the first one is really looking at public awareness. So raising awareness of loneliness as a public health issue, sharing what strategies there are to improve connections and create that feeling of purpose. The second aim for this coalition has been to look at research. Um, both from a place of, so we've been using a collective impact approach for this coalition. Um, and so part of the, the, the process of a collective impact um, uh, process is to have metrics, solid metrics for how are you gonna measure this? And so this team and this group has been focusing on how do we measure this? And then also looking at um, interventions that are available and we recognize that there's very few. There's a lot of research out there that shows that this is a problem, but there isn't a lot of research that shows what works. There's some, but we know we need to build this out. So um, that also is, uh, again, a goal of this coalition. Third, detect and respond. So this needs to stop being in the shadows, social isolation and loneliness, because it really is a, a huge risk to health the loneliness in particular aspect of it that can result from isolation. So how do we detect it early? And then what is our system of response um, for, for when that is detected early? And then last, advocacy. So what types of policy levers do we have? What sorts of policy solutions exist? And how do we move that forward? So right now we have uh, over 150 people that are 150 organizations that are members of the coalition and it keeps growing. So, um, and we also have, so I mentioned that these are the four aims but there are also work groups. So each of the work, each of the aims ha ha has a work group actually. So we have about, um, I think it's 70 of those 150 people that are actively engaged in those work groups really helping us build out all of these solutions, so. And you can move on to the next slide. Health promotion and disease prevention. I almost feel like saying duh, right? But you know, this obviously is a huge thing, but having our, our collaboration together has been, has been really significant and huge for us. And you can click one more time. So in Wisconsin, we have a Wisconsin Institute for Healthy Aging. WEHA is the acronym. And this is an organization that serves as a clearinghouse um, for our state that brings together um, both research, practice, and brings it, distributes it to our communities through our networks. So this is um, joint partners in this are our public health entities and our aging partners. So this really collectively together is not only um, 
it's, it's getting that research and those interventions into practice within each of our communities in partnership. So it's, there's a lot of cool things happening in this space too. So go ahead on to the next slide. I think I'm almost through here with, with my examples. Um, and so this one is uh, focusing back on the box. One of the boxes that I had on my first slide is really looking at livable communities, healthy and livable communities. So there's some joint work that we've done here in our, with our public health partners and our aging partners. Um, this, what you see here on this, this slide here, this is actually a toolkit and it has binding on the side of this picture. So this is just a snapshot here, but um, it's, it's a, a toolkit for dementia friendly communities. Um, and this was again, jointly created from, with our public health partners and our aging partners. We gave many grants to local health departments and our aging partners actually to work to integrate, um, or I should say implement uh, dementia friendly communities in our state. We also have a resource in our state that's unique. We call them dementia care specialists. They are people who, they're, they're actual positions that are located within our aging and disability resource centers. Um, and one of their jobs, uh, uh, there's a set of responsibilities that they have, but one of their biggest responsibilities is to be catalysts for dementia friendly communities. So again, having that solid infrastructure throughout our, our communities to do this work has made such a difference in that partnership that has come from public health and, and our aging partners. Um, and then livable communities. I, I'm not sure if people are familiar with this uh, livability index from AARP. Actually, you can click. I just recognize that it's not up on the screen yet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, so this is just an amazing resource. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with this, you can, um, it provides data at the zip code level, which we know is always the best. So uh, it's not national data, you know, this really gets into our communities and there's a whole set of incredible metrics that you can find um, in this space. So um, this is also a part of, it's a tool that we use throughout both our public health and you know, our aging spaces to really look at um, making our communities more livable. And when we make our communities more livable for older adults, we make our communities more livable for all. Next slide, please. Okay, so I believe this is my, well, almost my last slide. So I have talked a little bit or mostly about the interplay or the connections at the state level of our bureau integration within our division, but this happens at the community level. And so the point of this slide is that this is a, it, it can't stay there. It has to ripple out to our entire system. So there's um, been a, a lot of um, change that's been happening in these spaces too. And so part of my role has been to provide that type of leadership and support to local communities to really ripple this uh, throughout the state. So recognizing, um, you know, responding to and recovering from COVID-19 has done nothing but um, uh, solidify or advance the partnerships between our entities really seeing value. So in other words, if our pu local public health departments and our local aging units and ADRC, Aging and Disability Resource Centers, didn't see a reason to work together in the past, that has only helped to propel that those partnerships and learn more from each other. Second, integrating planning efforts. So I talked about the Shaw and the Chips earlier. And of course, you know, there's the Shaws and the Chips. And we have aging plans, both at the state level and at the county levels. And so coming together in terms of our planning, um, and there's a whole bunch of other examples of different types of planning that we do. And so just really integrating our planning efforts as, as that's happening at the local level and at the state level and has made huge, huge impact in, um, uh, again, what we do together. Addressing disparities takes all, um, but finding the value in integrating these partnerships in addressing those disparities. Even just simple things like applying for and administering grants. So this is happening all over our state. Um, finding that it's even more, the, the application itself is even more powerful um, and attractive to funders 
when we can show how integrated uh, we are and working together in these spaces. So I think there's huge benefit in doing that type of work together. And go ahead and click. So another quote I wanted to add here comes from a local aging and disability resource center in our state that supports three counties. And um, they have really built such strong partnerships and have really integrated their work. So this was a quote from her that just again, you know, makes the same point I made a moment ago, a moment ago, but she says that public health and the ADRC are working together as leads to re-energize our community coalition with many community partners. So we're all working on the same top needs together at the same time and hopefully having more effective outcomes. So, and then the last slide. I wanted to share this quote with you. And it says, in the forest, there's no master tree that plans and dictates change when rain fails to fall or when the spring comes early. The whole ecosystem reacts creatively in the moment. And I wanted to end with this because I do feel like we're very much in this space, that the rain has stopped falling. Spring has come early. And while the research is not all in on the impact of COVID, it is easy to see that we collectively were and are impacted by this epidemic and other experiences of this moment in many ways, physically, mentally, and socially. And it's also created new awareness of the impact on older adults when we don't work collectively to support them. So this quote highlights to me also that there's so much creativity that we have that's been transpiring in our communities to respond to the impacts to our human ecosystem. So we really have a huge opportunity to use this disruption in a healthy way to help grow our state and to reemerge and be a welcoming place for all. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Wow, Carrie. Thank you so, so much. Um, Karan, why don't we take the, um, the slides down so we can all kind of see each other at this point and um, um, see if, if anyone has questions. And, and um, so the first one from Marcy and uh, Department of Health in Washington. Carrie, are all of your state plans available online? They will be. <laughs> so we're, um, so for example, so our old plans are online. Um, but the new ones are, we're in the development phase. So for example, our state uh, health assessment uh, report that I mentioned will be online um, shortly. We're, we actually are expecting it last week. So in coming weeks, those will be available. And our aging plan is under development right now too. So again, we have an old one, um, but our new one will be there and available online. Great, thank you. And um, Taffy Morrison from Louisiana. Um, Taffy, if you wanna um, take yourself off of mute and just go ahead and ask your question of Carrie. Sure. The dementia building, can you hear me? Yes. Building yes. toolkit that she mentioned. Yes, 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 yes. There's a bit of an echo. Yeah. I think the dementia building. Okay, since there's an echo, I'll go ahead and ask the question. Um, so I think it's um, how can the toolkit be accessed? I'm not mm -hmm. sure if it's assessed or accessed, but I think you mean accessed. So that is also online. There you so go. right on our website. So I'll make sure that, that you get that, so. Yeah. Great. And it's used, it's so useful. It, I have to say, so I didn't build it. So that's why I will say this, but it's pretty amazing. I love it. So the people who worked on it did a really good job. Um, and it provides examples of all sorts of different businesses and ways that, that they can be dementia friendly, whether it's, you know, banks and credit unions or grocery stores or, you know, that sort of thing, just all sorts of different community actors who can, you know, play a role in, uh, in um, being dementia friendly and supporting people that come to their business. Yeah. Absolutely. And also caregivers too. So important. Yes, our caregivers are absolutely important. Um, so Carrie, I wanted to just ask this question. Um, I love the alignment, um, if we can call it alignment. I mean, the, 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 um, 
opportunity that you had um, to be intentional, but also take advantage of an accident, an accidental placement, right? Exactly. Um, and so, um, but not every state has that, right? Um, they're not, a, you know, in, in many states, they're completely separate, still siloed, um, in some states aware of each other, but still not working together. So for um, someone in a state health department or who's an, in, in an aging and disability lead, um, what, where could they start? Like, what, what would you recommend is the first thing that someone could do who really wants to see this kind of alignment happen in their, in their state? I love that question. Thank you so much. So, and I have a number of things to offer actually in this space. So um, uh, the first thing I would say is that you don't have to be organizationally integrated in order to operate in that way. So, however, if you are in a state where that's a possibility or people are exploring options for how to best organize themselves. Um, I have found that people aren't thinking this way. You know, They're not thinking about how aging and public health can come together. In fact, a lot of states are thinking about how aging and Medicaid can come together. Mm -hmm. So what I would encourage you to think if you are in a space of that type of disruption <laughs> to be intentional, You know, don't let it happen just haphazardly like it kind of did for us, right? Um, be intentional. It is actually, like I said, just been, it's been such an eye-opening and beneficial experience to integrate us organizationally. If that isn't even on your radar and it's, you know, and it, it brings all sorts of other types of disruption you may not want to touch. <laughs> it's really about that partnership piece. So simply reaching out can go so far. Um, and what I have found is that sometimes it's a, um, you know, how to move past that, I'm waiting for them to reach out to me. So it always takes that first person to really initiate that. And so if it's, if, if that can be you, um, I think that that is really powerful and impactful. And I say this, so I do these presentations also with aging, you know, folks on the national level too. So I say the same thing to them. So, you know, somebody who is really um, seeing the benefit and taking that first action to start to create these types of partnerships, I think is, is really important. The other thing is that I think as you do your work in public health and you look at the data and you start to see that your aging population, you really can't ignore them because they are such a huge part of um, the makeup of your, your states um, in, in the work that you do, know that you don't have to do it alone because you have this huge network to tap into. So there really are great benefits, you know, in, in really identifying that. And, um, and again, you know, working in partnership with that. So um, does that, does that help? I, there's a couple other things I could say. Yeah, no, I think that's terrific. Yeah, really that. helpful. Thank you. Okay, um, there were a couple of other questions here. So from Jay Bloom, Carrie, do you think age friendly will evolve into an intergenerational lens? Um, and then another follow up question an asset approach. Okay, I love that you asked that question because that is where we're heading right now. So part of being integrated into public health has also opened our eyes that, you know, older adults don't they're parts of families. <laughs> they're parts of communities. Mm -hmm. And so if we're, if we're only focused on older adults, we're missing so many things, actually. So the whole intergenerational um, aspect of this is huge. So for example, I want to look at um, from a nutrition, just here's one simple example. We have this huge system of support um, to provide meals for older adults. And states are all a little different in terms of how meals are delivered to others, if they are. There's a lot of people who are hungry. So we're starting to have conversations about how can we bring meals to families and braid funding, you know, integrate some of the different systems that provide these things. So yes, kids get meals at schools, but what, so, I mean, it just seems so awful to, you know, if there's a family that has an older adult and, you know, middle-aged folks and kids that they'd have to share a meal, um, 
So how do we really look at families in addition to that intergenerational piece that you're mentioning? So I just, I think there's so much opportunity there. And the other piece too is that older adults are such assets in our communities and they don't all need services. So when we're talking about ageism, you know, if we approach it from a lens of everybody needs our help, big mistake, right? But how can we use the strengths and assets of the older adult population to help move systems and make change for younger generations too? So we're really talking about, about bringing all of those, um, those, I guess, ways of thinking you know, into, into all of our spaces as we do our work together. Um, one more thing as an example, the social isolation and loneliness. So it started with a group of aging partners and public health folks that came together, but now it's, it's across all populations that we're really focusing in on. So I think even in fact, the slide that I shared with you, that was our, the first one we developed and it was focused on older adults and people with disabilities. We, had, we actually have modified that now to again, recognize this is an issue for everybody. Why would we isolate this? So um, it's also why our partnerships keep growing and building. And I just found out um, two weeks ago that there's this whole other social isolation and loneliness coalition in our state that is focused on kids and they have 150 partners. So we're like, you know, blowing up with excitement about bringing these groups together. So absolutely, there's huge opportunities there. That is so exciting. I have not heard of a coalition, a state-based coalition focused on social isolation among children. So I know here we're focused on older adults, but um, but that yep. really is exciting. And I, I think you're right. The intergenerational work is, um, you know, that's what's next uh, for sure. So, um, so thank you, Carrie. We are about at the end of our time. I wanna see if anybody had any, one more question. Yeah. Can I just say something, yeah, Carrie, yeah. Carrie, oh my God, oh my God, on behalf of everybody, wow, <laughs> what you are amazing and so inspirational, really, in, in all the ways, just on, you know, you're running with what's happening and, you know, in the UK, they have a minister of loneliness for all age groups and they have this odd Isn't fellows. that cool? Oh, it's so cool. And they have these odd fellow meetings everywhere, cafes, just groups of people coming together of all ages. And even right now, there's this movie out now that's supposedly, you know, for kids at school feeling so isolated and, and alone. And it's just yeah. a wonderful opportunity for people of all ages to come together on this. So I just love it all. You're terrific. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And I really needed that, by the way. <laughs> it's been a crazy time, right? So I appreciate that so much, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. So Ka Kathy is um, the, the guru of Florida age friendly. <laughs> she, <laughs> she is at the university. And you've been doing Florida. wonderful things <laughs> uh, here as well. So yeah. 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 So um, great, great to have two, two wonderful people meeting, meeting here today. So um, Carrie, again, thank you so much. You really are a rock star for us in the age friendly world. And um, we're so, so happy that you were able to share um, your story, many stories and examples um, here today. Your guide has been amazing. Um, and so we will definitely uh, be sharing the slides and the recording with, um, with everyone who registered here today, but also um, it will be up on our website um, under the events tab, which I uh, posted a little bit while ago in the chat. So uh, thank you very much. And we uh, look forward to um, our training in October. We will have our partners from the CDC Injury and Prevention Division talking about their fall prevention activities and other programs. So I hope that you all will join us on October 20th. Thank you all so much. We will see thank you next you. time. Thank you, Carrie. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone.